Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Bruna Smith and I'm on the marketing team here at H2O.ai. I'd love to start off by introducing our speaker. Arno Kandel is the Chief Technology Officer at H2O.ai. He is the main committer of H2O3 and driverless AI and has been designing and implementing high-performance machine learning algorithms since 2012. Before I hand it over to Arno, I'd like to go over the following housekeeping items. Please feel free to send us your questions throughout the session via the questions tab in your console. We'll be happy to answer them towards the end of the webinar. This webinar is being recorded. A copy of the webinar recording and slide deck will be available after the presentation is over. And without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Arno. Thanks, Guna. Hi, everyone. Welcome. It's an exciting time for H2O. If you haven't seen the news yet, uh, I'm in New York right now on the way back, but uh, I have this great pleasure now to share with you what's new in driverless AI. And there's a lot of things that are new, particularly the bring your own recipes part. But for those who don't know what driverless AI is, it's a automatic machine learning platform geared towards uh, enhancing the lives of data scientists to make them more productive and to give people with uh, less data science experience a chance to compete in terms of predictive modeling. So it, it takes a data set, you select the column you want to predict, and it does everything else. So it, it makes models, it makes uh, transformations of the data, it figures out whether the data is text and then does NLP on it, so it tries to understand the meaning of the text. It, um, takes time series and tries to extend into the time, into the future, doing causality uh, aware modeling. It does um, automatic cross-validation, automatic uh, time series moving windows validation. It looks at the data distribution. It uh, prevents uh, overfitting and leakage. So if you have uh, a data set that has uh, a lot of noise, it's, it's often possible to, to learn too much and to memorize the whole data and then not be good in the future when you make predictions because it, it remembers almost too much about the data and says, uh, for example, um, yes, this zip code and this income and this number of uh, cars means it's fraud. Even though it's not really fraud, it just happens to be that there was one person that looked similar that had committed fraud and now suddenly it thinks everybody is fraud just because these attributes are the same, right? So there's a chance that uh, models can overfit, and that's one of the main pitfalls in data science. And driverless AI has built-in mechanisms to prevent that and to do the best possible job at building uh, robust models that also can be deployed with ease. So when the model is built, uh, you get a scoring pipeline, which is code, so a, a artifact, um, either Python or Java or R or C++, that has all the states needed to make predictions. And that can be done outside of driverless AI. So driverless AI is a, is a uh, Linux-based software, but it runs in Docker. It runs on IBM or Intel chips. It uses GPUs or not, depending on whether you have GPUs. So it pretty much runs anywhere where there's a, a server or a PC or a supercomputer or just a laptop uh, available. So it's easy to run and very easy to take this deployment package out at the end and, and put the models in production. We also have built-in scoring servers and, and uh, APIs to deploy on the cloud automatically. Obviously, it runs on the cloud. We support all three cloud platforms and the the flexibility of the data import and all that, I'll show you that later. There's also automatic visualization to show you what's uh, going on in your data set without you having to do anything but press uh, one button. So the whole experience is geared towards a quick um, speed up of insights. Time to insight is minimized and it gives you a state of the art modeling and uh, feature engineering. And now with the bring your own recipes, you're even able to customize pretty much every part of the overall pipeline. So not only the algorithms used, such as gradient boosting or deep learning, but also the metrics to, to measure whether your model is good or not. You can build your own metrics, and also you can build your own data transformations. And I'll show much more about that in the, in the coming slides. 
So because it's a, a general platform for machine learning and data science, it can be used across many industries. It is built with open source components, but the overall uh, glue, if you want to put it all together, that's part of the closed source uh, proprietary solution that is driverless AI. So this is a different product than H203, which is a purely open source machine learning platform for distributed large scale modeling. Uh, if, if you know can be extremely powerful with H203, and this driverless AI is um, geared towards just automatically doing uh, much more work than uh, you, you could ever have imagined. So it, it's pretty amazing what the team has put together, and I'm very proud of the team. Um, we, are, we are still a small startup, um, but we are very, very powerful. We have 12 grandmasters right now of Kaggle out of about 120 or 150 in the world. So we have a very high density of, of experts and, and, and um, coders who are uh, really good. And this transpires in every piece that we do. So we won multiple awards, and um, it's, it's definitely a, a well-loved product. So if you haven't tried it yet, please give it a shot. Uh, you have 21 days free trial. You can uh, even get an academic license for free if you're a student or if you're teaching this. Uh, data science practitioner um, or practice, you can you can be a practitioner with driverless AI. You can show what basically uh, the state of the art in automatic machine learning and how you create features and how you um, productionize models and how you can compare models, what does it mean to optimize a log loss versus an AOC and all that. Everything is in the platform. Now, imagine you have this workflow where you start with a data set and you end up with a production pipeline. Uh, there's a couple of things you can specify along the way, such as uh, what do you want to predict? Uh, is it a time series problem or not? Uh, do you have maybe observation weights? Do you have uh, stratification needs so that you have different groups treated um, differently, that not every row is independent from all the other rows? Maybe you have six different cities and you want to train on, on three cities and score on the other three. You don't want to mix them up, otherwise you would be learning too much maybe. So if you have a case like that, a driverless AI has the capability to let you control that. And these recipes definitely give you a lot more control than you ever thought you could have. And it's very accurate out of the box. So for example, this is a Kaggle problem that I personally participated and so did Dimitri and Brandon and Marios and uh, Faron, all these grandmasters here in the top, they were all active two years ago on Kaggle and now they're with H2O. And for example, Dimitri himself was one of the main contributors for the um, automatic feature engineering. And with the press of one button, you land on the 10th place in this Kaggle competition. You see this private score here of 42.9 log loss? That's, that's here. That is pretty impressive because there were 3,000 teams that participated and this competition went on for, for two months and these teams have submitted hundreds of submissions, right, to see how they can improve the model. And, and driverless AI does it out of the box, basically, in a couple of hours. So this is uh, something we're very proud of, the, the ability to do good feature engineering and, and create features without making mistakes and creating them fast and, and building thousands and thousands of features and hundreds of models, all while you're having a coffee, basically. Now, the, uh, the making of h 2 driverless AI is, is, is really something we're very proud of. The team has put together tremendously uh, smart pieces that, that plug together just like a puzzle. And it, it is it's astonishing, even now, after another almost a year since this blog was written, we've added so much new stuff. So I will, will write another one soon to show you how the recipes were made, for example. But um, you see here this visualization component that uh, Leland Wilkinson wrote, who is actually the, gra the author of The Grammar of Graphics, the book that's behind ggplot and also Tableau, the company. So he pioneered the uh, grammar of graphics, basically the building blocks of visualization. And, and he's doing this automatic visualization for driverless AI with his uh, algorithm and they find out uh, insights into the data um, automatically. So if there's no insight, there's no plot. It only shows you stuff that's, that's special about the data set, such as outliers or correlations or interesting looking distributions or missing values and so on. 
The roadmap is continuously expanding, and in version 1.7, which just came out uh, last month, now uh, a few days ago we shipped version 1.7.1. We now have much more than ever. Obviously, it adds to it every time, so we never take features away. But for example, we added GPUs a long time ago. We added all these connectors to Hadoop and S3 and 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 um, Google Cloud and and Azure and um, AWS and Parquet and all these different formats. If you have data in JDBC, that's now also uh, connected. So Java-based databases, even uh, Windows SQL Server is now supported. So you have uh, the ability to pull in data from pretty much anywhere. It runs on all the clouds. Um, it has time series. Time series got improved recently. We have even more um, systems in place to do good back testing and to do uh, modeling in a way that when you come in with your test data later that contains actual outcomes for the past, then the model's prediction gets even better. So you can basically provide all the data you have uh, for the past. And when you score new rows for which you don't have the answer, those answers will become better as you provide more and more um, actual data to the model as it is in production. So in production, kind of the model keeps learning and it always stays up to date until you have to retrain it. There is um, light GBM, TensorFlow. We have now with the recipes we have, here, this is our recipes. We have PyTorch, you know, we have uh, Arima, we have Profit, all these different types of models that you can think of, all kinds of SQLearn models. Pretty much anything you can program in Python is now possible in driverless AI. And you just provide the idea, and then driverless AI figures out which of your ideas are useful or not. So it's a very good way to, to test ideas quickly and experiment, fail fast, keep innovating, and keep iterating, and, and make, make basically the ideation of, of solutions your job. Instead of dealing with for loops and uh, splitting data sets and so on, you're now focusing on the actual idea of a data scientist, which is how to create better features that even driverless doesn't do yet. For example, domain-specific insights like specific string splitting of, of healthcare codes or hierarchical you know, structures of, of your data, you can now implement those custom transformers. We also support R with an R client API, and we have uh, the Mojo, the scoring pipelines I mentioned earlier that now run uh, TensorFlow models, TensorFlow NLP, a recurrent um, bi-directional GRUs, and, and CNNs, character level and word level tokenizers. So pretty much state-of-the-art models that are now part of the Mojo deployment package. And Mojo means standalone, one single file, you can put it anywhere, any Linux box, and you can score these models. No need to have a Python virtual environment or anything like that. It's all um, self-contained. We have always had a tremendous amount of interpretable um, components in the in the product. So every time you build a model, it's it's interpretable. It means you can say uh, for every row and for every uh, data set is a global uh, view, basically what's going on. Is it, is it uh, this feature or that feature that, that determines whether you're going to get rejected, for example, for an application? And then for every particular row, such as a person, for example, you will see why that person was rejected, um, which of the features contributed how much to the overall uh, decision. We have decision trees. We have uh, partial dependent plots. We have individual conditional expectations, so what happens if your age goes up, what would have happened, for example, and so on. So there's a lot of um, things going on there, and even more now for time series, and also there is um, um, in th disparate impact analysis. So if you're, if you're uh, living in a different zip code, suddenly you get less credit, then that will be exposed by this, this model debugging tool that will tell you, hey, it's not fair. And there are even means to remediate that and make the model fair. So there's a real, if you want a debugging station in the product to make your models fairer and to make your models uh, more generalizable or more understandable to the human. And there's a lot of um, components that are being built all the time. So MLI, as we call it, this 
machine learning interpretability is one of our core components that our customers love, especially the regulated industries. And for time series, for example, you can ask every point in time for every group. So for example, every store and every department has its own time series, and we model all of it at once. We have hundreds of sub-models that are built automatically by this um, grouping and by XGBoost that sees the lag features. Everything is created automatically. And all these different uh, features that go into this massive XGBoost model that then sees all these subgroups help uh, predictions to be per group in, in, in super fine detail. And it's not univariate. It sees all the other columns too. So it's not just the time line that gets extended, but it's actually you can have 100 columns in your data set, and you can extend all of them into the future and then have predictions made based on them. So it's a pretty cool system. And you can also see for each point in time why the decision was made and how it adds up to this value here. So if you have a house price prediction, you can say that the number of bedrooms matters more for around Christmas or something like that. Right? There's real uh, um, insights to be had here. Now, the main strength, let's say, of the feature engineering is that we have dozens and dozens of ideas that have been built and robustified. They are uh, production grade. They just work. They don't crash. They don't have problems. They don't overfit. So we have uh, eight-way interactions of categorical and numerical features that we get pinned, that get um, grouped, that get automatically aggregated. So for all these interactions of these different columns, every unique bucket in this, let's say, six-dimensional space has its own uh, out-of-fold estimate of the target based on which group you're in. So everybody with the same zip code, the same number of cars, the same number of bedrooms, let's say, has a house price, right? And you can then cut the population into five pieces, and for all the five pieces, you ask the other four pieces, what's your house price if you have the same number of cars and so on? And that gives you a good estimate of the answer without actually cheating by asking for the answer for that particular row. It's always the other 80%. So that gives you a, a target encoding that's leak free, and you still get a really good number here as an estimate, and that number becomes another column in the data set that the model sees. That's called target encoding. And we have many other systems in place that do similar things based on clustering, dimensionality reduction, regular interactions, rate of evidence, and so on. And now you can make your own. So you can add many more of these ideas, and these features can extract more information from the data set. The time series problems are normally handled with lag variables, so you're basically saying what was the value of the sales price or the, the weekly sales, let's say, for this department and this store 44 weeks ago, and that is a good number, and hence it shows up in this variable importance listing. But the most important one was like a smooth moving average, exponentially weighted smooth moving average of the, the lags over different number of weeks. So like a year ago, two years ago, and maybe also Thanksgiving or something instead of Christmas only. So that's a kind of a um, indication of what kind of numbers matter for the store. And we put that all together. We iterate over it. We do an evolutionary strategy where these different models and pipelines and features fight. And then the winners survive at the end. And you will then get a, an ensemble of, of, let's say, 26 models in this case, where they together make up the final model. So it's one model that consists of 26 inner pieces. And that is a stacked ensemble that then performs really well. This is the one that was 10th place at Cargo. And all of this was done in this case here in like overnight. But uh, as you saw earlier, the other one ran in two hours because we ran it on a 4G GPU box. And then it looks like this. You see the timeline left to right. And each green blob is a GPU that's being used. So as time evolves, you have these parallel four GPUs that are in parallel build models over and over again. And the red stuff in between, that's the feature engineering. So we build features, we, we fit models, we build features, we fit models, and so on. And the, the feedback from the, from the modeling goes back into feature engineering and vice versa. So whichever features are built, depending on what features we build, we might try different models. And there is a whole brain inside that figures out what to do. And of course, we use statistical techniques like reusable holdouts to, to make the models uh, estimated well, so we know how well the model performs. We don't just score on one test set and then see that we can get better, but we do it in a way that doesn't let us overfit. We do deep learning and we do statistical learning. Everything that 
is needed, and we have grandmasters that guide us that say what works for modern data sets and modern solutions. So we always know kind of what's, what's important, what needs to be done. Time series, as I mentioned earlier, we have this time component. So if you have two weeks to predict, but you have a gap, where you go to production, let's say, there's one week of where you, where you don't collect data before the model goes to production. So you can only ask for the, the value from a week ago or from two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and so on. So the model, when it goes to production, is trained to learn not from yesterday's value, but from last week's value, for example. And that, you can put that into the validation scheme and it becomes more uh, accurate when the model is performing well on that scheme. For NLP, you can count the words and you can build statistical numbers out of those counts and then you can see if your document, uh, your, let's say the tweet that the person wrote to the airline is some, has a word in it that's rare, that means it's kind of important for this sentence because it's not normally used by everybody else, so we need to take a lot into account. Or, for example, there's embeddings that, that can map um, man to woman, just like king to queen, there's the same distance between them and it has an understanding of the meaning of the words based on this embedding, some, some sub-dimensional uh, mapping using uh, neural networks. And you can even load pre-trained embeddings now, so you can build your own embedding unsupervised uh, using, um, let's say, only your healthcare codes and then later you can plug it into the driverless uh, system and then fine tune it on the outcomes such as people uh, coming back to the hospital or not. You don't have to train it from scratch every time, but you can. Both methods are possible. So either you're trained from scratch or you use a pre-trained embedding. And as I mentioned earlier, we have convolutional neural nets, recurrent neural nets, and a character level or text level um, Tokenizer, so we can even do like let's say Chinese or Arabic fonts, uh, and and just parse character by character and, and learn from that. There's a lot of data connectors. We just recently added added a JDBC, as I mentioned. So there's it's, it's uh, um, any database Hadoop space or Java space. Um, we have Hadoop file system, so HDFS is is supported. You have all the cloud vendors, KDB, Minio, Snowflake, and so on. So if you have any needs to uh, import your data from some other source, please let us know. Another highly requested feature that we just added this week is the, the column type setter. So you can now set the type for this column to be a categorical, for example, even though it's like from 1 to 50. And you, you know it's not an integer because it's just a department ID. It's not really such that 27 is more than 26. It's just a different store. So you can say, hey, look, it's categorical. And then this logical type that you're setting will be used by driverless to say, OK, I'm not going to do a, a difference between store and department, just like I would do that for a numeric column. So now I know it's categorical, for example. You can also set the date string format in case you have an exotic format that might not be detected by the internal parser. But usually the format gets detected, like in this case, it automatically detects the date format. We now have a project workspace where you can make leaderboards and compare models. So you can import into this project space. You can say, these are my two data sets, one for training, one for testing, let's say. And then you build a bunch of models on this training data set. And then you score them all on this testing data set. And you get the score here, right? And you can then make a leaderboard out of it and then compare them all, for example and you can see the ROC curves and so on. And, and that helps you figure out which model you want to put in production. We have expert settings in the product, which help the experts get what they want. Sometimes they say, I don't want TensorFlow. Sometimes they say, I want only TensorFlow. You know, sometimes they want to have um, the string detected as a, as, a, as a text only. But now that we have this type setting, some of these features here in the expert settings are no longer needed. You can just set the type. But there is some threshold sometimes. Like, for example, when you want to drop a column when we detect a, a leak or a, a distribution shift between training and testing, if the, if the column is too different, let's say it's the temperature between spring and winter, that's not really a good feature because when you make predictions in the winter, you're never going to see the same values that you saw in the spring. So we are saying, hey, look, maybe we should drop it. And this is the AUC 
that we would use as a threshold for dropping that feature. And the AOC, of course, is on a binary model that detects um, whether or not a given row is in the test set or in the training set, given this feature value. As I mentioned earlier, we have R on Python clients, so you can connect to it from R or Python, which means you can have a laptop with an R session, and you can then uh, say, hey, download this file from Hadoop, and then run this experiment, and your server that has, let's say, the four GPUs in uh, Amazon uh, will just do the work. So you don't actually have to click in the GUI if you prefer to do scripting. And obviously, Python was the first class citizen. Everything that we have in the product is written in, in this Python language here, uh, both the APIs and the actual backend implementation. So um, Python is um, the natural client, but everything gets automatically translated to R as well. Then the deployment part, as I mentioned, these are the standalone runtimes. So once you have this runtime, either for Java, which means on any box, or for Python and R, which have Linux, you can have these, these Mojo artifacts that come out of the model, and you can run them in production. So this runtime allows you to import this, this, this Mojo file and then make predictions. And these runtimes are backward compatible. So once you have a runtime, you can score all previous modules that were made by other versions of, of driver API. And I can also show you a quick visualization here. So if you have a mojo, you can actually look at what's inside, and you can see how complex those get. So this is a simple example for um, a very small data set. And you can see that the graph that comes out, that the feature engineering pipeline is rather complex already. So this is a weather data set, and we are predicting whether or not it's going to rain tomorrow, and here different pressures and, and humidity levels are, are used to make this model. So this is roughly the complexity of the smallest model you can think of. If you have bigger models, there's much more going on, hundreds of transformations and dozens of models inside. Once you have a model trained, you can also deploy it to Amazon with the click of a button once you enter your credentials, or you can run a scorer server on the same instance as where driverless is running. So imagine you have this on Amazon running in some AWS instance, then you can make the REST server. And as soon as you push this button, you can post these strings, let's say, either through a command line or through your application. You can post this JSON blob and saying, hey, I have uh, these feature values. So for the text, I have this tweet. And when that comes in, the model will return you the score for the street to be, uh, let's say, if, um, happy or not happy, right? So this is all, um, with a single click, you get this model deployed on the same instance where uh, driverless is running, in case you're not interested in doing it yourself using the Mojo. Now, this is the, the biggest, uh, latest innovation that they bring your own recipes. So there is a whole GitHub repository, and I'll show you more, in a second where you can make your own recipes. And they're all open source. And they're basically saying, write any Python code that you want as long as it complies to our API or conforms. So the API is similar to sklearn. You have to have a fit and a predict for a model. And you can put anything behind it, whether it's Catboost or you know, PyTorch or your own C++ code that you have a Python wrapper for. As long as it's a Python API, you can run it. And you have to be able to pip install it somehow. So you can provide the name of the Python module, such as like um, PyTorch. And then when you upload this uh, Python snippet into the running system, it will just act like a plugin. And suddenly, you'll have PyTorch. So you don't need to restart. You don't need to do anything. It will all automatically install it if you write the recipe in the right way. And we have 100 examples that should help you to, to make your own. Now for transformers, you have to have a fit and a transform, and actually it has to be a transform and a transform. The fit transform says, give me a data set, I'll learn from it, and I also transform the data into the new shape. So you have the same number of rows, you just give us different output columns. You can take any number of input columns of any type that you want. So you can say, I only want numeric, and I always want two columns. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to add them up. Or you can say, I want all numeric columns, no matter how many. 
and you will count the number of missing values per row for those numeric columns, for example. Or you can say I want all columns, and you will pick out age and income, and then do a ratio of those two because you know you will have age and income as features in that data set. So you can make it totally custom, just like, let's say, a Kaggle problem or your own problem at work where you have a, a specific name for a column. You can hard code that, and then that's your recipe. So there's no need to write generic transformers like we had to do to make it work for any data set. You can now make it custom to your problem. That makes it easier for you to write um, simple extensions that then still are very powerful. And one of the best ways to get value is to break your own score. So for example, you can say, um, given the actual and the predicted column, let's say you have a house price prediction and actual house price, you can compute not just the difference and then the absolute value of the difference or so, but you can do um, things like only you know, penalize maybe if so do it this way, if it's more than $2 million, do it this way. And then you have different penalties, and then the model learns to become better at the more expensive houses, for example. But in a nonlinear way or in a way that you care about, or per zip code, you can care more or less about different price levels. So you can really customize your solution to be targeted to what you want to achieve in your business world. And you can write that Python code, and it's very simple to write that. As I mentioned, we have 100 examples here on this GitHub, and maybe now would be a good time to go there. Actually, I have a page open already here. So in GitHub, there's this repository. H2AI is our company name, and then driverless AI recipes is the repository. And this is Apache V2, open source. You can do anything you want with it. We already have 22 contributors. Many of them are Kagglers, and we have a little bit of a description what's going on, but more than that, we have these hundred examples. So for example, if you want to do an extra tree sklearn model, you would make this class, you would inherit from custom model, you would say that you can handle regression and binary and multi-class, you would give it a name, you would make a method that says what are the default parameters that you want, and once you set them, you can use them in the fit later. You can even say how it should mutate itself when we say do some parameter tuning. Every time we do a different instantiation of the model, we might mutate it a little bit so that we can get different parameters tuned. So you can try different number of trees or different number of uh, you know, depths and so on. Learning rate, everything you can change yourself. This is just an example, but you can see how easy it is when you fit. All you need to do is make a classified regressor in sklearn, maybe get rid of some missing values, and then fit. And then when you're done, you can set the model state with our wrapper here. That's the same wrapper for all models. You just tell us what you want to save as bytes. And then later when you go into a different sub-process to make predictions, those, those bytes get come back from this get model property. So you have back your model, which whatever that is, could be PyTorch, can be anything, can be CatBoost, or in this case, sklearn. And now that you have that model, you can use it to make predictions. And once you have predictions, um, you can use it to make um, your NumPy output, for example, for a per class probability. And once you have those per class probabilities, then that will be used to make uh, predictions uh, and, and actual values, put them together, and you get a, an, an estimate out of the performance of the model using the scorers. So if we go back to the scorers, for example, and oops, an estimate of a scorer uh, would be something like this here. I mentioned, for example, the top decile would be a good one for um, regression. So you have regression true. You say you want to minimize it. The best score is a zero. You don't support sample weights yet, these observation weights. You can also say that you have them. Then in that case, you can actually pass an observation weight through. But if you don't support it yet because you're either lazy or you don't know how to implement, you can just say, no, I don't have it yet. And our acceptance test, by the way, when you upload this, will say, hey, I detect that you have not yet uh, added this. I'm not going to bother. But if you say true here, which is the default, then it will even test that it's correct. And if it's not, it will complain and say, hey, please do a proper implementation of this method. So we actually do some safety checks for your own custom logic. In this case, you would say, give me all the, the rows here. Sort them. Tell me the 
uh, 90th percentile of the, the prediction, so it'll give me the cutoff at which price that's only then 10% left above me, and then those rows are being measured only, for example, not everybody else. And this gives you a, a number back that is basically judging how well you get the expensive stuff right instead of how well you get everybody right, right? So this is something that's particularly uh, targeted for the expensive stuff. And there is a lot more uh, scorers. Hooper loss, for example, people like that, it's more robust than uh, squared loss and, and slightly sh uh, less sharp than the mean absolute error. You can have all kinds of ideas how you can make your, your loss functions, and those can actually make a big difference to the um, optimization problem. Now, when you run uh, driverless AI, you would normally have a data set imported like this. You would say you want to make predictions. You select the column you want to predict. In this case, it's a credit card uh, data set where you want to predict whether or not person will default on the payment next month. That's a binary outcome. And now you can go to expert settings and you can upload a recipe. And you can actually upload it directly from GitHub. So if you go to GitHub and you say, hey, I like this, 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 this function here. And this function can handle binary classification, so we're good. So now I'm going to take this link here, but I'm going to take the raw link, not the, this one, because this one here is pointing to this web page, which is HTML. We want the raw code, so it looks just like a file with the um, pure source code in it. It's a little bit slow here. Just a second. You can also point to it from your local machine. So you can download it first. And once you have it downloaded, you can upload it from your laptop, for example, or from wherever you're writing the recipe. Yeah, it looks like GitHub is not responding right now, so I'm going to upload it from my local machine. I'm going to say Upload Recipe, and I'm going to go to the driverless AI recipe folder. So I, I cloned this repository, and I'm going to pick that Hooper Loss Scorer. And as you can see, now it's testing the acceptance test, make sure that everything is fine, and now I can actually select the um, scorer to be Hoover. And that's how easy it is to make your custom scorer. You just have to write that source code, basically. And you have these 100 examples to do that. Now, you can also upload a different model. So, if, for example, I mentioned the um, cat boost and, and ex extra trees, but there is also H2O, of course. So we can take an H2O model. So I can take all H2O models, and they just get added to it. And now you will see that, by default, they're enabled. Every time you upload it, it gets enabled by default. If it doesn't show up in the preview, it means you have to go to the expert settings and then enable them. So because I just uploaded it, it shows up here. Now you see we have not just GLM and XGBoost and LightGBM, but also H2O, AutoML, Deep Learning, Gradient Boosting, Linear Models, Naive Base, Random Forest, everything. But if you say, oh, that's too much, I don't want that, I just want H2O. GLM, let's say, you can go to recipes and include only that. So you can uncheck them all and only add this one. And for example, now you'll have an H2O GLM running to optimize the Hooper loss for this loss, uh, for this problem that we had. And that's how easy it is, okay? And by the way, when you're running uh, it sometimes pops up with a message saying, hey, look, I found something. It's always a good idea to read what it says before you click it away. So in this case, it said the data is imbalanced. It says there is um, an ID column that was found where every value was different, so it's not a really good predictor, so we can drop that. And uh, that's exactly what we did. Now checking for leakage, it's checking for... Um, it cannot do a distribution shift detection because there is no test set, but if you had given a test set that was slightly different, it would have warned us and said, hey, there are some columns that look slightly different. Did you know? And if you say, yeah, I know, I know, that's fine, but it's, sometimes you don't know that and say, oh, thanks, uh, now I learned something. And now it's basically building H2O GLM models, and you can see that it's using CPU, but if you look on GPU usage, it's empty. There's no GPUs used because H2O GLM is a purely CPU-based method. You can go to resources, look at system information. You can see 
the CPU is being used here, for example, how much disk is left, what other experiments are building, and so on. Other people might be locked in too. I'm locked in as, as me right now here. You can see my name, but other people might be running experiments too, and then you would see that maybe the system is busy. But right now, people are leaving this machine alone because I'm doing this webinar. Um, that is a log that you can watch, and the log will say, hey, look, I'm doing uh, this and this. So right now, it's doing um, Hooper loss here, as you can see. It's building an H2O GLM, and you see already the, the, the loss. And you see the features that are the most important. It's already clustering bill amounts, pay amounts, and so on. And it says that's the most important feature. So it's, it's quite fun to watch the system learn and improve over time. And you will see that the, every yellow point is another model that was fitted on some uh, transformed data. And as time evolves, usually get better and better until it converges, and then it will stop. If you say you only have 10 minutes, you can go to expert settings and you can set the time here at the beginning. You can say, I want 10 minutes, no more. And then it will try its best to finish after 10 minutes. You can also disable the, the shift detection and so on if you want to save time. If you know your data set, you don't need to always do that. And once the data, um, once experiment is done, you can say, do one like this. So the ones that are done already, you can just say, hey, make one like it. See, another one with the same parameters. And then you just change whatever you want to change. You don't have to enter all these expert settings again because it just remembers from last time what you had. And so now you basically will do the same thing again. But now you can change maybe the interpretability or you can make it more accurate and so on. So this is a nice way to build another experiment. If you have to turn off the system because you run out of time or the power goes out or something, don't worry. We have checkpoints. So even if you kill this right now, you can always later say do another one from the last checkpoint, or you can retrain the final pipeline. Final pipeline means the model that was fitted at the very end. So for example, for this one here, this is the one that is the Kaggle winning solution earlier that I showed. After, let's say, four hours or so, it, it came to this point where it, 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 it was done, figuring out what to do, all these interactions. And at the very end, it makes this super smart ensemble of 20 models. And you just want to say, I want that 20 model ensemble again, but this time I want to have only 10 models instead of 20. So two five-fold cross-validation models, for example. So you could say, do one more like this uh, on this experiment, but then just say final, ex uh, final pipeline only, please. And then you can just reduce the accuracy and say go, and it will do just that. You don't have to learn again what to do because it remembers that this, this uh, feature transformation that you need to have a good model. So this state down here is the final model. And you might say, nah, it's too complicated. I don't want accuracy 7, so just go to accuracy 3 and say go. And then it will use the same features, but it will make a simpler final model. You can also say, I want to make a linear model at the end on these features instead of a boosting model. And pretty powerful this checkpointing, right? You can, you can literally change anything you want, but these features are still going to be the same. All right, so I wanted to show you quickly the mojo. So the mojo is just nothing but a file. That's the state of the model. It's protobuf, so it's serialized into bytes. And here is the runtime for Java. And then all you need to do is run this, this script here that does nothing but a um, some Java command line, right? It will print out what the Java command was, but it's like a class path, and it runs some, some class. So if you do this, this script, it will just score on my laptop. This is a Mac, and I'm scoring with Java. Java is portable, and this, this protobuf state came from this Linux server on Amazon, and you immediately get the, the predictions for um, every row in milliseconds using this, this low latency scoring pipeline. OK, so let's go back to the presentation. For example, for text problems, if you want sentiment analysis, um, normally we, we don't have a sentiment um, pre-built feature engineering step. Right now, our, um, our NLP module has um, the statistical methods I mentioned, TF, IDF, and it has these character level and, and bidirectional GRUs and regular text-based CNNs. And those already make the log loss pretty good. So if you only have statistics, you get to 0.6. 
what if you add these neural nets to get to 0.49. But once you add this text sentiment uh, recipe, which is just a very simple recipe, you import text blob and you say, please make prediction, and you get that pre-trained model to give you insights. And text blob, let me show you that recipe. It's, it's very, um, very elegant, it's very simple. You don't need to write anything. You just import it and you call it. It's a transformer for NLP and it's sentiment. And we have a lot more examples. That's it. That's the only code you need. And you don't even need this actually. So this, you say we want one text column and you want this pip installed, text blob. And then you can import it. And in the fit transform and the transform, you call the same method, which is just sentiment analysis method that you wrote here, where it just calls text blob of the string and asks for the sentiment. This is coming out from some other package. And that's all you get. And that's all you need. And that adds um, instantly a couple points or one point or so to the log loss. So this is a use case of a recipe. Another one is the time series recipe. So Arima alone, you can have an Arima recipe that we also have open source. You can have a profit recipe. They both do well, this especially, but then if you use our defaults with the lags, it's, it's better. And when you actually put all three together, you get down to something like 1800 or 1700 absolute error. But it's nice to be able to combine those ideas and make the gradient boosting model on top of all these features that are made by these other models. So it's, it's interesting to, to see that it's not just one model that you get, but you can have Profit and Arima as features. Their estimates of the outcome is just a feature. And then you can mix that with lags and other things, and then suddenly you get a much more accurate uh, model. And these models can also have interpretation um, numbers, but it's not going to tell you exactly why Profit thought that this should be the number, right? Because Profit is just an external package that says, I come up with this number. That's why it's better to use the lag features, because they'll tell you 52 weeks ago is the number that matters the most for my sales. And you don't get that insight from Profit, at least not in, the, in this form right now. You would have to be uh, taking Profit apart and helping us create um, an insights recipe, and we're working on making MLI also recipe fight, so that you can have recipes for MLI, and that's going to be an exciting future where you can customize your interpretability ideas. So there's much more information about recipes, complicated diagrams about what goes where, which which transformer accepts what kind of inputs, and so on, and how to implement them. And that's also something that's super important for most customers, which is the automatic documentation of these experiments. So every experiment you make automatically generates a Word file. And in that Word file, there's 20 pages or so that explain everything about the parameter tuning, the model selection, the, the leakage, the shift distribution, like when we drop certain columns, why we drop them, which metric was used, what the ROC curve was, what's the partial dependence for all these features, what's the support behind them. So in this case, for example, if the balance limit is high, then the, the, uh, the likelihood of default goes down. But obviously, going negative is not that meaningful, so it's flatlining here, but there's also no actual observations on the negative half. So it's good to see the support of the data and not just the, the partial dependence. And our goal really is to delight data scientists. So if you're a data scientist, you should find this tool or this platform very, very useful. If not, please let us know. Cry like a kid or a baby, as Sri says, our CEO. He always has very inspirational talks, and his, his community and customer-centric uh, culture of the company is really permeating through everybody in the company. So all we care about is customers being happy or you would, would like to have more. Um, we are working on it most likely. We'll have more about multi-node. We'll have more about model management. We'll have more about multi-user. Um, we'll have more about you know, multi-GPU training and so on. There's a chat that you can join, which is an open chat room for the community to participate from Slack. We have webinars also about how to make recipes in more detail than today. We have uh, business-centric talks, 
and we have obviously a lot of uh, tutorials how to get started. These are um, really useful if you're starting out with driverless AI. You can you can follow these tutorials. You see the downloads they're there on our webpage h2o.ai. Everything is on h2o.ai. So if there's anything that you can't find or you're missing something, please let us know. But I'm, I'm more than happy to answer questions now. We have 10 minutes. And I can also do more demos, whatever you like. So let's see what you have. Um, there's four questions so far. So do we have license to technology schools? Yes, so academics um, get free driverless AI licenses. So please reach out to, um, I think, on the website. When you go to our website and you say academic, that's where you go. It should be easy enough to find. And from there, you can. Uh, submit your request to get a free trial license. Go back up you can al here. You can, also, you can also send an email to academic at h2o.ai. Great. So yes, the question is, did we submit this to Kaggle? And the answer is yes, absolutely. So we have 12 grandmasters, right? They probably submitted 10,000 uh, submissions to Kaggle in their lives, but we did that too. So when we took this model here and we submitted it, this model um, had some Git SHA of our version, some settings, it ran so many iterations. I wrote it down. This was my cross-validation score of 4354. And then when I submitted it, this was the private score, this was the public score. So this is what you would have seen during a competition. And this is what you saw um, after the competition, basically, when it was over, it would say, this is how good you are on the, on the private. So now, obviously, uh, we did this two years after the competition finished. So you can say, hey, it's cheating. Why, why do you show this and not something else? And yes, it's true. There are some other competitions where we would only be in the top 10%, not top 10, for example, right? It's not easy to win every competition. And the reason for that is that many competitions have either a leakage in there, where people basically exploit that leak, and then spend two, two months doing um, basic trickeries on the data set to get better, which is something you wouldn't be able to do in production. So often the availability of the test set is not there. And also the, the data maybe was prepared in a way that the order of the rows in the data set gives away the answer. And that's not realistic for, for real production. So this one here didn't have a leak. Well, actually, it did have a leak. That's what number one here found. So they actually had a small little order in there. But only, only I think, these two, the teams or so, only a few found out that secret. The rest didn't. So we are basically participating together with the rest that didn't find out that secret leak. Um, and we're doing as well as anybody could have done by hand, basically. But there are, there are reasons why you can't win every competition that's beyond just the modeling quality. It's about insight into the data, right? And if you now have, let's say, real insights, like, oh, I know that there is a leak. I have to get the row ID, and I have to subtract something, and then take the, you know, difference to the other row, and so on. You can now do this with custom recipes, right? Let me show you a custom transformer. You can now basically win Kaggle with these custom recipes, but you have to know what you're doing, right? So you have to be able to, let's say you, you, you want to do something with the you only count the positive numbers or something. This would be the sum of positive entries in all numeric columns, right? And this is something useful. And let's say this was the leak. Uh, obviously, it wouldn't be as simple as this, but you can write any logic that you want now as another feature. And it's not up to us to know what your leak is going to be, but you can say what your leak is, or even better, your business insight. Because leaks are not really good for business, right? You don't really want to mess with leaks. You want to move on and delete that leak and, and make the data speak for itself without you having to cheat. So Kaggle is a little bit different in that respect because it's very hard to make a competition on past data without inadvertently giving away the answer slightly sometimes. Unfortunately, that's what it is. But if you're in real world production, then you don't have the answer for the future. And, and that's where we really shine. It's because we, we do the best we can to not overfit and to give you a robust model. And people who say we overfit, usually it's because the data has the leak in it. So if you, if you have data that has the answer as a column, in the latest version, we actually will detect that and they'll tell you, hey, there's a leak, right? 
So please let us know if you detect any issues with our leak detection, but we feel like it's, it's very strong and should help you avoid making mistakes. We have another question here um, regarding any plans to support reinforcement learning in driverless AI? Yes, we have plans, but it's not easy to know exactly what they are because uh, reinforcement learning needs millions and millions of repeats, right? So if we wanted to make a little brain that gets smarter over time, um, which we, we have one, but we're working on making a better one. The question is whether reinforcement learning is the best version of that brain. It could be, because you don't just click up or down like a video game and then you either win or not after another hundred steps. It's, it's not quite as simple, right? Because you have a million knobs to turn. Like you can make the depth of your tree a little bit more. You can also make the column sampling. You can change the feature engineering. You have 100 columns, each has 100 parameters, that's 10,000 different things that each can be in 10 different states. So you have, you know, 10 to the 10,000 and all that. Like it becomes, it becomes a little bit too complicated, basically. It's not as simple as a, as a video game reinforcement learning or a, a walking robot or something that only has several degrees of freedom. This has a lot more degrees of freedom. So usually you have to do something else and reinforcement learning. But we're aware of it, and we, we like the idea of using it for something, but it's not quite clear what that would be. If you have ideas, please let us know. So if you want to try it out, you just go to, tr to Downloads under the H2AI, and you can either click on these to get the cloud version started, or you can download it yourself either for Linux, either as an RPM package, a Debian package, or as a, just a directory you can untar, or as a Docker file. This Docker file would then also run on Windows or Mac. They only have the Docker version. And then there's an IBM Power version, and um, there's a bunch of documentation, and obviously there is much more information than on just on the download page. You can go back to the, to the uh, documentation page. This is filled with, with information, right? There's the tutorials, there's videos about how to start it. And we have other products like H203 and Sparkling Water, Enterprise Steam and Puddle. Puddle is, by the way, a platform to orchestrate driverless AI. So if you have Puddle, you can say, hey, give me an instance on a 4 GPU system, and then that pops up the IP address, and you can get going. You don't need to do anything else. So it's nice for your own private clouds to, to launch driverless AI for your team. Great. Okay. Um, thank you, Arno, for taking the time today and doing a great presentation. I'd like to say thank you to everyone who joined us today. The presentation slides and the recording will be made available on our Bright Talk channel. Have a great rest of your day.